Hello, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. I'll be your host for an hour of answering all those great gardening questions. You can phone in your questions, 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Toll-free number is 800-676-5446. You can also send us emails and pictures. That is to byf at unl.edu. We do try to answer those emailed questions on future shows. Give us as much info as you can, including where you live in the state. Also, be sure to check us out on all those usual cool social media outlets. So let's start with Wayne came down from the cold north country carrying a weapon. <laughs> Some <laughs> so, might call it a weapon. <laughs> well, if you're an insect, it's definitely, definitely. a weapon. <laughs> what do you have? Well, I brought my insect net down with me tonight. Uh, it's kind of a standard tool of an entomologist, and I got something ready for the audience. So let's here it have goes. It. So this is my insect net. There are many like it, but this one is mine. My net is my best friend. It is my arm extended. I must master it as, as I master my science. Without me, my net is useless. Without my net, I am ineffective. I must swing my net true. I must swing my faster than my quarry who was trying to escape. I must collect him before he escapes me. I will. My net and I know that what counts in collecting is not the attempts we make, the noise of our exertion, nor the vegetation we smite. We know that it is the captures that count. We will capture. My net is a mechanism, even as I, because it is my science. Thus, I will learn it as a brother. I will learn its weaknesses, its strengths, its parts. Its handle, its ring, its bag. I will keep my net <laughs> clean and ready, even as I am clean and ready. We will become part of each other. We will. Before the audience, this is my creed. My net and I are the collectors of insects. We are the masters of our quarry. We are the contributors to my collection. So be it until success is ours and there is no quarry but rest. I'm yeah. sure some of our listeners will recognize what this is <laughs> adapted from. Uh, just remember that imitation is the ser serious form of flattery. Exactly, and keep that out of my backyard farmer garden. I, you know what, your vegetation smitten? You no, I don't, no smiting. <laughs> All right, Matt, your first uh, night on the show. I don't show have anything too. that exciting, but I do have a sheet of paper, <laughs> and I'm going to let them zoom in here, and I'm going to talk about, um, as we are finally getting rid of some of this winter weather, uh, the snow looks like it might be gone, uh, we're all going to want to get out there with this warmer weather and start doing some lawn work or some, uh, you know, applying some herbicides, some pre-emergence. And one of the most important things to do when you're applying pre-emergent herbicides or any other herbicides, especially when you're uh, buying them at the store, you need to know how big your lawn is. Um, I don't know how easy it is to see on here, but uh, this is kind of just a map of our research station on East Campus. And you can see here that I have kind of a white outline uh, around this area of turf. And what I used was Google Earth, and it's a really good tool to basically figure out the exact area you have and then you know exactly how much product you need. So in order to do this, uh, you have to download Google Earth or there's other ones that kind of do the same thing, but this one's the easiest to do and it's free. Um, and you use the mapping tool, which is on top here. It's called add a polygon or there's a little ruler up there and you click on that. And then you can actually plot all the points. You can plot around your house uh, or around you know small areas of landscaping. And that'll basically tell you exactly what square footage you have here. And this one is, what did we got? 3,600 square feet, roughly. So uh, without doing this, I would have never known. I would have had to get a tape measure out, do a lot of measurements. Uh, so this is one quick, easy way. I can do this in about two minutes. So it's a, it's a good, useful tool. And it'll help us apply products correctly so we're not over-applying or under-applying and then wondering why they, why they work or why they don't work. So. And you just have to hope that Google flew over when the leaves yes. were not so on there, the trees. There's multiple images usually for right. the last five, six years, and hopefully you can find your house on there. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. All right, Kyle, you're ever hopeful with this particular yeah. specimen. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's spring, so I figured what else do we always show in spring on Backyard Farmer but cedar apple rust galls. So I had uh, went and collected some, uh, some galls from some cedar trees here on campus. 
And um, as you can see, they are just starting to put out these little horns on them, kind of these orange teleal horns, which maybe you guys can see on the, uh, on the camera a little bit there. But if you have any fruit trees, this is what you want to be looking at, especially apple trees, because this cedar apple rust will, the spores will blow from the cedar trees onto, your, onto any apple trees that you have. And so if you are worried about, um, about rust on your apples, now is when you want to start to uh, start your spray program to control those diseases. All right, and once we get more rain, they're just going to go. Exactly, they will. They'll be orange aliens in about a week. Perfect. All right, Jeff, you apparently clipped about everything you could find on campus. Uh, well, anything I could find that had some uh, resemblance of a flower on it. <laughs> so a couple of things that we're looking at because you know for the whole state right now or the whole region there really is not a lot in flower and we were talking about how things like magnolias and crabs and some of those may have been zapped a little bit here in the last couple of weeks so we're not seeing too much or there are these brownish white flowers right now so not really beautiful what i have here so um, our little white ones our white catkins are off of a quaking aspen so they're uh, really pushing hard today today's warm weather really really had them doing their things um, these more brownish flowers are a little older catkins off of a, oh, a um, hazelnut, um, so off of a Turkish hazel. So that's it's doing uh, it's been doing its thing. They extended a while back, and then in the middle, if we can see here, so we have some boxwood flowers, and uh, the boxwood especially um, started this weekend. Even with the cold weather, I noticed mm -hmm. it, and boy, they're really doing their thing today. So. Mm -hmm. And many times you'll see bees early on, on on the box. It seems like that's because there's not a lot of other things in bloom. I'll see bees um, working on the boxwood. So they're a little stinky, though. That's the downside to the boxwood. So Yeah, cat box comes Yeah, away. right. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the bees apparently can't not smell the yeah, cat box. Right, so. right. Well, thanks, Jeff, because it's always nice to, <clears throat> excuse me, to use things that are woody plant material right. for flowers. All right. You get the first picture question, Wayne, and it's actually two pictures, and we had about three or four of our great viewers send them in. The first one is, what is this? And this is actually on a fine line buckthorn, so he wants to know what the thing by the ruler is. And then he was worried that the little white flecks were pathogenic or insectish. So, okay. and then the second one is similar. So let's talk about both of those things. All right. Well, I, I want to congratulate the first picture. That is a great way to take a picture with a ruler in view so we know the size, good information on the plant. Mm -hmm. um, what I'll tell you, the larger item in that picture is a praying mantis egg case, or if you want to use the entomological term, Othica. Mm -hmm. And inside of that are a number of eggs that will hatch once the weather warms up a little more than what it is right now, probably more towards the middle of May. Uh, on a normal year, I'd say maybe early May, but this year, mid-May. And the other one is also a praying mantis egg case. Now, they look different, and they're supposed to. The second one uh, is the Chinese praying mantis, the large ones. So those four to five inches pretty regularly. Some people say they get eight inches. They really don't get quite that big, but they are big and impressive. And the first one is our Carolina praying mantis. Mm -hmm. The second one, the Chinese mantis, as the name implies, is introduced. The Carolina one is one of our natives. And we don't have a lot of natives. Most of ours are introduced. Yep. So pretty cool. Anybody who sees those, let them be, let them be. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And those are lettuce cells, by the way, right? Those are not insect flex or I'll let the pathology. plant person answer that. The they are. <laughs> They're supposed to have flex. <laughs> They're not mushrooms. <laughs> Little tiny ones. All right. Matt, um, this is an Omaha viewer, has a maple concerns uh, because the roots are showing. Tree appears healthy. Uh, some of the roots were cut apparently with some construction or something. Uh, wondering what he should do about this and what he can do to improve the turf under the tree. So what are we thinking he should do here? Um, anytime you have a tree of that size or as thick as that one is, there's going to be almost 100% shade under the tree. Mm -hmm. So something that you can do to help with that <coughs> would be if there are roots exposed, maybe adding a little bit of soil, not too much. Um, just to cover them up, but you don't want to go too deep. And then also that's going to be a higher area of watering because that tree's going to suck all that moisture from the grass. So watering that area maybe first before anything else or just adding a little bit more. Uh, also seeding some of the better varieties for shade would be another one. Uh, some of the 
tall fescue I have under mine at home too, and it, it does pretty well. Uh, so that would be one that I would recommend over maybe bluegrass, uh, and it seems to do a little bit better. Um, and then as far as the tree goes, maybe pruning the tree to thin it up or thin it out or even, you know, limit up a little bit to allow some of that directional sunlight in there in the morning and afternoon, and that'll also help. Okay, and don't hit the base with the lawnmower. Yes, don't ever hit the trees. <laughs> with the lawnmower, no. Yes. <laughs> All right. Kyle, you mm -hmm. have uh, a wounded yellow delicious apple. This is, uh, she lives in Harrison County, Iowa in the Lust Hills and uh, looks like woodpecker damage, bug damage, fungus sorts of things going on. Death becomes it or what do you think? Um, unfortunately, most likely. Uh, yeah, there's, well, any time you have um, woodpeckers on a tree, that's a sign that there is, or there are some other bugs in there already that are feeding on something. And especially if you start to see these, uh, these fungal fruiting bodies erupting out of, out of the bark, it's most likely rotting the sapwood. And that is a, a, just a sure sign that your tree is experiencing some sort of stress. Now, the, the insects, the, the sapwood rot in and of themselves probably won't kill the tree, but the combination of everything after a while probably will, will take it down. So I would kind of start preparing yourself for, to plant something else there. All right, thank you, Kyle. All right, Jeff, so you have an interesting first question too. Okay. And yours is actually comes to us from a viewer who is wondering, they're in Kearney, okay. and they're wondering about a good, nice low shrub that would take this kind of high filtered light, sh light shade right. condition. You know, actually it's, um, you know, there's a lot of good choices for something like this. So this is this is really kind of a nice location to plant things, and and um, so you have a lot of choices. One of them, you know, we talked, uh, Kim and I talked a little bit about aronia, so black chokeberry, and there is uh, a variety low mound that does well, and that would be a lower growing one, and, and would offer some some flower and some fruit and some nice color in the fall. So that's a good choice. Uh, and then you could really look at a variety of things. There's uh, many hydrangeas to pick from. So there's oak leaf and, and pentacle and, and also um, um, the arborescence uh, as well. So, um, and you know, I don't know, you really can go a lot of directions. I was even thinking things like some of the dwarf blueberries might do well in something like that. I know it's carny, so you'd have to amend the soils. Mm -hmm. uh, PJM rhododendron would do well in a situation like that, so if you want some color. And on campus, we mix, um, or Kim, many years ago, maybe not that long ago, but would mix <laughs> redbud. that long ago. <laughs> would mix uh, redbud with many of our spruces. Yeah. And they are a great companion uh, mm -hmm. with each other. They seem to do very well, whether the, we add some color there with the spruce in the spring, but also the spruce tends to protect the red bud a little bit. So yeah. I, I really like those that combination. So maybe one of those mixed in there might kind of add something to that. Good. Well, I hope uh, he takes advantage of those suggestions. Thanks, Jeff. You know, we've heard about what happens to turf and insects during the winter months. For our first feature tonight, we're going to focus on plant diseases. Kyle tells us that just like insects, diseases have specific ways they fight the freezing temperatures and they are ready to be a problem when things turn warm. And now that we're finally starting to have some sunny spring days, or close to sunny spring days here in Nebraska, you may be wondering if these recent cold snaps have done anything to kill some of the diseases that may be bothering our gardens every year. Unfortunately, the answer for that is not really. Uh, most, of our, most of our fungal diseases and bacterial diseases, we actually store them at minus 80 degrees Celsius, so about negative 150 degrees Fahrenheit. So needless to say, many of these pathogens are able to survive Nebraska winters just fine. So you may be wondering, where do they go during the winter? Well, a lot of these pathogens will form spe special survival structures, whether they are sclerotia, um, fungi that form sclerotia, which are these darkened um, spores that are a little bit larger than normal, and they'll just reside in soil for years, or they, we have some bacteria that 
produce some spe specialized spores as well, such as endospores. Now, some of these fungi need to be beneath soil in order to survive the winter, such as uh, Phytophthora, which causes late blight of, of, of potatoes and tomatoes. That actually um, stays in the soil on infected tissue in the um, underground. Compare that to alternaria leaf blight of tomatoes, and those um, that resides just on leaves right on the soil surface. And so this is why fall sanitation or even early spring sanitation is so important to control diseases within a garden. By removing a lot of this old dead tissue or the, any tissue that, had, that you saw disease last year, we're now able to remove that from the, from the area completely. And maybe there will still be a few leaves that have a few small spots, but we really want to get rid of as many of them as possible. The other thing that's really important as far as controlling diseases as we get into the summer is we want to look out for our weedy hosts. And so our virus diseases, a lot of them can actually survive on some of the weedy hosts that, that may be common around our garden, whether it's lamb's quarter or uh, field pennycress. And so, so a lot of these fungal pathogens, they get really cold, they survive the cold, the, the cold temperatures, but as soon as we start to get nicer days like this and a little bit of moisture out there, well now those fungi and bacteria are able to wake back up and they can start to colonize any, infect, any plant tissue that's still there. Maybe it's roots that are left over from last year or maybe you, started, you went ahead and planted something early this year. Well, days like this, even though it's still technically beneath these pathogens' optimal temperature range, they can still become active and start to, form, not start to cause infection. In conclusion, it's really important to clean up your garden at the end of the fall or early in the spring before we start getting nicer weather like this. While we may go ahead and pull out the above ground parts of all of the, of, of the plants, it's also important to remember to try to get rid of as much of the root tissue as possible because a lot of our soil-borne pathogens are residing there. So just like with insects, a really effective way to control those garden diseases is to do that cleanup in the fall and in the early spring. And uh, again, if it's diseased, not in the compost pile, right? Yep, correct. Okay, all right, you get the next picture, Wayne. Uh, this is a viewer in Midtown Omaha and she has white pines. They are doing this down the trunk and uh, she was told by uh, a professional to inject the tree. So do we have a notion on what this is or do we certainly have a notion on what to do or not to do? Well, at this point, since we can't see where the sap is oozing from, we don't know what it's coming, it's a, a damaged branch that's broken a windstorm or one of our winter storms this winter and is now oozing out. With sap flow, is it going to get trimmed off? We don't know where it's coming from, so we can't really diagnose the problem. And since we don't know what the problem is, proper integrated pest management would tell us not to treat mm -hmm. because we can't effectively treat the problem mm -hmm. if we don't have it identified. When we were talking off air, it's not typical for white pine to have Zimmerman pine moth. It's mostly a ponderosa pine problem. Right. So at this point, unless Kyle has something extra to add. You know, um, it, that anytime you see that kind of that white effuse coming out of a, out, out of a conifer, um, Cytospora canker is one of the big things to be looking mm. for there. And so I'd maybe, if you can, try to follow that, follow that white liquid up and see if there's not a canker that you're dealing with there. Mm -hmm. And at my house, you follow it all the way up and you find the bird's nest. And you find the yes. <laughs> <laughs> hate to say it, but yep, that too. <laughs> all I'm right. not Dennis, but that doesn't look like it came from a bird. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Matt. Um, this is a, uh, a question about a particular weed in a very clumpy, sort of strange, compacted, not great turf to begin with. They want to, and, and this was sort of an irrigation damage question too, so okay. it was compacted. They're wondering what is the weed and then what can they do to A, get rid of the weed and B, reestablish a decent turf in this location. Okay, yeah, first off, uh, at that point, it looks like, I mean, the weed there is knotweed or a prostrate knotweed. Mm -hmm. And that one's the one that's coming up right now. It's pretty much the only lawn weed that is emerging, the summer annual which it emerges early on in February and March, so it's the one that's always up first, and it almost looks like grass until you get down there and look close. Uh, so getting rid of that, 
Uh, depending on what you want to do, if you want to get rid of all the grass that's there, the clumpy grass too, you could actually do a non-selective application, uh, so a, a roundup application, uh, and that would get rid of everything there. And then you could start over with uh, basically a fresh, fresh lawn. So you'd start with whatever you're looking at, uh, tall fescue or bluegrass, um, and that would probably be the best way to do it. And if you don't want to kill the grass that's there, uh, there's a lot of products, 2,4-D works on it, but not as good as a combination product with 2,4-D, triclopyr, uh, and dicamba. There's a ton of products out there with those three in them, and those, those seem to work the best to get rid of knotweed this early. All right, thanks, Matt. <clears throat> All right, so it must be a um, tree issue for you tonight, oh, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a great viewer from Hershey, Nebraska, has two different fruit trees. Uh, a Stanley plum, about 15 years old, not looking very healthy. The bark is split. He's, and again, this, you know, there's some issues, but he's wondering, should he go ahead and take this out? And the second one is an apple. Uh, he's wondering if this is ever going to be a healthy tree. So, again, well, time to talk about those pathogens. Yeah, and, so, uh, so we can start off with the, uh, with the plum tree that they had um, or, uh, that with the pretty severe cracking down the, um, down the side of it. And I'm going to guess that that's probably a frost crack. And so it happened this winter or, or really kind of even within the past couple of weeks, the, the extreme heat followed by the extreme cold, the temperatures that we've been getting have been kind of increasing the amount of frost crack that we have seen. And it is much more, um, th the thin barked fruit trees are much more likely to get this frost crack than some of our, some of our thicker barked trees. As far as what to do about it, um, really not a whole lot. Um, I would maybe recommend if there is a lot of kind of loose bark or dead bark along the outside, uh, you can take a knife and go and, th and trim that dead and loose bark away. That can help it form some callus tissue uh, to close up that crack. However, if you are going to do that, make sure that you're disinfecting your, your knife fairly often. If there is any fungal pathogen or bacterial pathogen in there, you don't want to be spreading it as you're cutting off some more, some more bark. Otherwise, that will probably just heal on its own. Um, and now, the, as far as the apple tree, the base of this tree, it might not ever, uh, it kind of depends, really. Um, uh, really seeing something this low to the ground, there can be a lot of issues with it. Um, so I would just kind of watch the tree throughout the season. If it's leafing out okay and the leaves are looking all right, it might survive for another couple of years. Um, however, with that, anytime you have that discoloration right at the base, you do have concern of a collar rot, maybe some phytophthora or something else that's going on there. And so again, keep an eye on it. Uh, maybe give it some extra loving this year, but don't be surprised if you have to replace it. All right, and I don't think we have plum on campus, Jeff. No, we don't. Mm -hmm. We have apples that look yeah. almost that bad. Right. <laughs> so, all right, thank you. Jeff, you have an Arthur, Nebraska viewer question. Okay. Uh, garden is filled with well-drained sandy <clears throat> soil. He tills it every year, consistently gets carrots and parsnips that look like they have legs. Right. So what can he do so he gets nice single roots? You know, and, and because he's in sandy soil already, you know, the only other recommendation would be to uh, increase the amount of compost that they're using and try to add some of that in there to help prevent this a little bit. Um, that would probably be the only thing that we could do. I know that there are some fungus that will cause this mm -hmm. to do this a little bit. Yeah. And um, so, and, and that the other thought would be is if they're using the same area to plant them right. every year that we move mm -hmm. to another place, prep that bed and see what kind of results we get. Right, all right, thanks. You know, most of what we've shown you this year in the Backyard Farmer Garden has been in the greenhouse because it's been much too cold to get anything started outside. But for this week, Terry James takes us outside to the garden to take a look around. Let's spend a few minutes to see preparations for the upcoming growing season in the Backyard Farmer Garden. in the backyard farmer garden we're going to continue to talk about kind of what we did all winter long as you can see in the garden everything is pretty much cleared up and you don't see a lot of cool veggies flowers or anything like that last october november we took everything out we wanted to make sure that we were not leaving any kind of disease or critters behind that would influence our potential crop this year 
We also hand turned all of our soil over so that we were making sure that we were not having any compaction. We left our little paths in the middle of our big beds so that we were also again then making sure that there was no compaction areas in our garden. And then we came in and added about 20 yards of compost on top of this all over those annual beds, making sure that we're adding that good organic matter into our garden. We let Mother Nature take over then after that, and we let the freeze and thaw break down all those big clods that we turned over. So now, as soon as it warms up, we are able to begin sending those great plants in the greenhouse out into the garden. You know, you might think our soil looks awfully chunky, but that's really the best way to prepare beds. And as Terry said, Mother Nature will take care of the rest. We will have great garden soil once again. So those of you visiting the garden, keep your boots on the path. All right, so we have, unfortunately, Wayne, pine wilt has been discovered in an adjoining state, Wyoming. So you wanna talk for a minute about when do the Sawyer beetles emerge, fly, and do their things? And in other words, when to cut down those infected trees? All right, so the recommendation for cutting down infected trees with pine wilt, so we're gonna be looking primarily at our Austrian and Scotch pines. White pine can occasionally succumb to it. Uh, it is a native disease and a native insect. So <laughs> it's likely been in Wyoming for a very long time. Uh, from that aspect, you wanna get those trees cut down by March. Mm -hmm. so that way you've got them down long enough so that when the pine sawyer beetles start flying the end of May, basically through the summer, they have an extended go, they can have a couple generations in a year that come out in various times. You gotta get down early. You gotta get down before the growing season starts if you wanna get okay. trees down and reduce the inoculum. And if you're not growing a white pine or a scotch or Austrian pine, it likely was something else that took it out. And the pine sawyer beetles are attracted to dead and dying trees. Okay. So those are the ones you wanna target. If you wanna play it smart, and if you got one that's dying, you let it die, you sit for a few, well, maybe a month during the summer, then lop it down, you could actually trap some of those pine sawyer beetles. Take some with it. Take some with it, yeah. Perfect, all right, thanks, Wayne. This is a beach question. Oh, Matt, um, too cold for a viewer <laughs> <laughs> or a wetsuit. <laughs> this viewer lives uh, uh, on a lake just south of Papillion and has a, a double layered beach and wonders what, what they can use to actually kill all of the weeds in the, in the beach sand uh, without hurting anything else okay. and, and harming, of course, the, the aquatic yeah. stuff. Yeah, so I think the only thing that I know of, I'm sure there's other, there's a, you have to use an aquatic product that's gonna actually be safe to get into the water because if you're spraying on sand, it's ultimately gonna end up in, in the lake. So uh, reward is one that I know is safe to apply over water. So you could use it on the beach and it's a basically a non-selective herbicide that'll kill everything. So be careful with it, still you follow the label, uh, but that's one that I would look at first. And I know there are other aquatic herbicides that, that are out there, so look, look it up and see if you can find another Rodeo. one that works. Rodeo? Rodeo. Rodeo. Okay. Or Habitat. All right. There you go. There's a couple of them. <laughs> one, two, three, with yep. interesting names. All right, thanks, Matt. Kyle, uh, this is a Coleridge viewer who says they can't, they don't have enough room to rotate their tomatoes, so okay. what can they do if they're good to prevent diseases? Um, big things is going to be sanitation. So make sure that you are cleaning up your garden um, really well in the fall and removing not only the above ground material, but also the below ground material to make sure you're removing all of the roots as well, or as many of the roots as possible to um, just take away any of those places where, or some of these soil borne fungi can, can survive the winter. Another thing that you can do to prevent uh, disease spreading as we move, move into the season a little bit is uh, try to avoid overhead watering as much as possible. Anytime you water overhead, splashes down and those spores that are on the soil can then splash up and start to uh, cause more disease. But really sanitation will be your best friend. All right, thanks Kyle. Jeff, this is a viewer in Southwest Omaha, has a big old overgrown lilac. Uh, he does know he should prune after it blooms, mm -hmm. very overgrown and empty in the middle, so wondering how he should prune. 
Any ideas on the best thing to do? Well, um, you know, our, typically our recommendation is to take out a third of the largest canes out of the lilac. Um, and with something like this, it may be a little trickier when you're talking about an older plant. Um, so, you know, you may end up taking out more than a third. Uh, and this is going to be a multi-year project. So, you know, this first year I would take out the really the very large ones. Take those out, kind of stand back, see what your plant looks like. Um, and then just know that next year you're going to kind of keep doing this. So it's going to be a three or four year process of taking out these big canes and you'll finally get it down to a, a size and it'll start flowering and start doing its thing. And, but again, you're going to have to be a little patient. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Well, before we go to break, we'd like to remember our dear friend, George Edgar. George helped us answer questions on our phone panel for many years. He always showed up with a smile on his face, and sometimes he'd have a huge bag of raspberries from his garden for everybody to try. He was a dedicated master gardener. We will really miss him. Six. While you are doing that, we will start the lightning round. Are you ready, gentlemen? Sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, can a 10-year-old grapevine be transplanted, and this is Douglas County, uh, that would be a tough one if it's very big. I mean, I would look for a sucker or something like that that you could try to transplant. You might have better luck with that. All right. We have a Seward viewer who is saying they still don't have any green on their roses. Are those toast? Well, if the cane themselves is actually green, I would be patient. If it's turned brown or if you can see a distinct kind of black line between the brown and the green, you know that that's, that's kind of your lifeline, so to speak. Okay, we have a Bertrand viewer who wants to know what is the correct fertilizer NPK for a vegetable garden? You know, it really varies on the vegetable itself. You know, there's that common 10-10-10, so kind of a balanced fertilizer um, is probably your best bet. So there's a lot of varieties out there, or a lot of choices out there of fertilizer, but I think you can't go wrong with something like that. All right, can Easter tulips and daffodils be planted outside and when? Well, yeah, if they're in a pot now, go ahead and plant them outside now. That's fine. I mean, they're not going to do anything at this stage, but, you know, by next, by next spring, you'll have something. All right. Nice job. You ready, Kyle? I suppose. <laughs> Such confidence. Such confidence. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is a uh, Norfolk viewer who lost a maple to verticillium wilt wants to know if they can plant another one in the same location. I would not recommend it, no. All right, we have a DeWitt viewer who has really strange white rectangles on their cedar trunks, about half an inch long. Any ideas? Um, no. The word is <laughs> pass. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have uh, Omaha viewer has a boxwood that has died from the top down. Is that what boxwood blight looks like or is that something different? No, that's um, it's probably <clears throat> winter kill, something like that. Boxwood blight, we tend to see it um, attacking much more of the center of the plant than kind of moving out. Okay. We have a Columbus viewer who wants to know, is it time to spray for the diseases of pines or are we still too early? Um, we are getting to be pretty close, and so a lot of our a lot of our pine diseases, we want to spray that first application right about when the needles are about half emerged. So we're we're getting there. Okay, this is a grower of greens who wants to know how you can prevent rust streaking in their lettuce. Um, boy, rust streaking in their lettuce. I probably going to be a just a scheduled uh, fungicide program. Okay. Anytime we're dealing with the rust. Or water. Or water. Okay, <laughs> or buy it at the grocery store. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you ready? Six yes. Six times? I'm ready. Six times? I'm like these two, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's <laughs> confident. All right, uh, this is a Lincoln viewer who has not aerated their lawn for five years. Should it be aerated? Yeah, if you have a thin lawn and it's compacted, yes. All right, and when does that happen? Uh, you can do it in the fall or you could do it in the spring after green up, and that'd be a good time, probably here in the next two or three weeks. All right, the entire state is wondering about applying pre-emerge. When? When it's the right time. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I'd say we still have time. We're looking at soil temps. We're just getting back into the 40s after this next week with warmer weather. Yeah, we're going to be getting closer, so it's still going to be about that first, second week of May. All right. Um, a country acreage owner wants to know whether they can just stop mowing their turf and that will convert it to good plants for prairie and pollinators? Uh, yes, I actually like leaving it grow. Uh, you'll get seed heads depending on what grass you have. Tall fescue looks a little better than bluegrass, but you can let it go, but it'll get clumpy and you might have to burn it every other year or 
something like that to get rid of the debris. Okay, which crabgrass pre-emerge will still allow seed to germinate? So you're looking at a seeding, mm -hmm. uh, mesotrion, the one that I think Bill mentioned last week, uh, okay. which is on a Scott's product. Uh, Quinn Clorock is also another one, and Tupersan or Sidron. Okay, and can homeowners get those last two? Uh, yes, they should be able to in some form. I know they sell them just at a different name. So look for those ingredients, Quinn Clorock, Sidron. Okay, Queen Clorac or Sidron, and you got bonus. I heard that in my Yeah, ear. that's. I'm pretty sure that was worth two. <laughs> All right, you ready, Wayne? I feel like I should grab my net and say we are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Your first is there. A uh, viewer has found shiny black beetles about a half an inch long in the soil. Are those good guys or bad guys? Uh, if they're like what I've been finding when I've been planting in my yard this spring, my dormant st stock. Yes, they are good guys. Okay. They are the ground beetles. Ground beetles, all right. A fifth grader in Beaver Crossing wonders how deep do worms go when the soil is cold? Mm. Well, it's not an insect, so I'm not sure, but I do know they go below the frost line. Okay, well, it's close to an insect. No, it's not. Well, ant bait stakes at the base of a, a bird feeder pole help the ants stay away from the hummingbird they feeder. could, if okay. they're dense enough that they're gonna I think that's a easier food to get to than the bird feeder. All right, do corn earworms attack tomatillos? They can, and there's also a closely related species that will as well. All right. I can't remember the common name, but I know it's Helicopter zea for the corn earworm and Helicopter armigera for the other one. Uh -huh. All right, <laughs> and on that note, um, what chemical for treating Japanese beetles uh, is restricted for use on lindens? You can't find anything for use on Linden as a system whatsoever. After that incident in Washington State that happened about seven or eight years ago, ever since then, they've eliminated Lindens from anything systemic. Okay. You can get a topical like a carbaryl type or permethrin product that's non-systemic, but you cannot apply it during bloom. All right, excellent. Lead the label very carefully. All right. There I've run into some issues where some stores have recommended things that shouldn't have been. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I feel threatened. Watch yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeff, what do we have for Plants of the Week? Well, we have two, well, two things that were flowering that I didn't catch that you did. Um, first of all, the, the white flowering one is a prunus, Nanking cherry. Um, and then the yellow is a forsythia. What forsythia? Northern? Northern sun. Northern sun. <coughs> so we'll talk about the Nanking cherry since it's a personal favorite of mine because you can eat the fruit. Mm -hmm. And so I try to grow things that I can eat. Um, so Nanking cherry is a great little shrub. Um, it'll get maybe six to eight feet tall. It's not a long-lived plant, but it has kind of a pretty exfoliating bark. It has these nice flowers and then it puts on a, a very tasty little fruit. Uh, later in the summer. Uh, you have to watch the birds will get after it right as soon as they uh, start to ripen. So you may have to put a bird net or something over it or just stake a, put a child out there and have him swing at the birds as they come in <laughs> with, with his net. Um, but anyway, so it's a great plant, but like I said, it's not usually very long lived. You might get eight years out of it and then they start to decline. And then our northern sun forsythia, again, it's doing great. And this is, even with our weather, the forsythias have done pretty well this year. I really haven't seen any problems with the forsythias. And much like the question earlier about the lilacs, the forsythia is another plant that tends to get away from people. And so that's one that after you've had it in the ground for a few years, you'd want to kind of get yourself on a program of every year going out and taking a few of the bigger canes. And that'll maintain its size. Forsythia is one of those, especially some of the bigger ones have a tendency to get quite large over a, a long period of time. So. Okay. Excellent. And those are both actually good for early pollinators. Right. If great. there are any that are yeah. out. Right. And, and <laughs> they're <percentage>. desperate. <laughs> telling us to put a pre out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you get a third picture question. This is a valley viewer, Wayne. They have two red twig dogwood, which we had canker on a couple weeks ago or last week. Last year, leaves started to die. This year, noticed about 75% of the branches are covered with scale. He can remove them with his fingernail, but he wonders, can he, can he save these shrubs? What should he do now? Yeah, so this most likely, even though the picture isn't great, most likely is oyster shell scale. Mm -hmm. Pretty common on red stem dogwood. Um, if the plant has not broken dormancy yet, you can use a dormant oil to help smother 
those scales. Otherwise, you're looking at a June-ish timing when those crawlers, so those are the eggs that are hatching from underneath the scale, start spreading over the plant, and that would be the time to hit it with a contact spray of some kind, or find something that's labeled as a contact spray for dogwoods or other ornamental plants after bloom. Or cut all those scaly stems off and you start can, over. You can, if, Maybe. see how it comes back. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Matt, this is a Fremont viewer. It's a classic uh, utility cable thing going on, and they've repaired their little holes they've dug with these green squares all the way up the block. Uh, they did this work in very wet conditions. So their question is, what should they expect in terms of recovery? And are, are they going to have a different green yeah, square in the I, lawn? It, it might be, <laughs> depending on what they used for the seed underneath that. I'm guessing that's a seed mat. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what they're using that for is basically to keep that seed moist. And it works really well at getting grass to establish. Uh, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. Once that stuff establishes, it'll probably end up matching the grass. Uh, might be a little bit different color of shade of green, just depending on the cultivars, but uh, I wouldn't worry about it too much. It's actually better doing that than leaving it just a dirt pile without watering. All right, thanks, Matt. All right, Kyle, another tree. Awesome. <laughs> this is a Blair viewer. Uh, it has a six-year-old Yoshino cherry, which is actually an ornamental, total split in the trunk. Uh, wondering, is is this the death knell on this one? She's starting to see some oozing and some some sorts of nasties in this yeah, one. Yeah, um, that's a, a pretty pretty gnarly looking crack that we're that we're getting there. And I again hate to say it, but prepare yourself to plant plant something else there. Um, could be could be the result of a few different environmental conditions, but typically once we see that severe of in, in, uh, that that severe of injury, the tree is not going to survive a whole lot longer. All right, thanks, Kyle. All right, Jeff, you get this because she wants to know what to put back, but Matt, you need to know that there's been an awful lot of weed control. So this is a uh, Elkhorn viewer. She's given up on turf in the rights of way because the, look at how dinky they are, mm -hmm. and there's a storm sewer. Um, she has done some spray with Roundup. She, did, she wants to cover it with mulch. She said there's been an awful lot of nut sedge. Wonder should she keep doing that sort of weed control first and then are there some plants that might work in there? Mm -hmm. Well, with the nut sedge is a, is a plant that I would not, um, um, I, I wouldn't think that, that it, it could still come back. So I wouldn't have any confidence that you've got it all. <laughs> and I, at this stage, I would want to wait till certainly mid-June, Matt, before I would uh, start thinking about planting things in there. Yeah, and if, if you can see that nut sedge coming up and you do want to treat, then treat it as soon as you see it, and that's right. going to be the best result. Yeah, so that would be the whole thing. I, I wouldn't get in a big hurry to plant anything at this stage. And then, you know, there's really a variety of things that you could look at. I, you know, I look at a place like that, and I think it'd be nice to see some clumps of some small native grasses, some mm -hmm. blue grandma, some cytose grandma, even maybe a little bit of buffalo grass in there in some spots. And then you have your purple cone flowers, purple prairie clover. I mean, there's a lot of things that you could put in there that would really handle that very well. So yeah. there's a lot of good choices. All right, thank you, Jeff. Well, as we continue on with our theme of coming out of the winter with our turf, insects, and diseases, what about those landscape plants? Our weather guy, Ken Dewey, said a slow spring is good for those plants, so let's take a look and see if that's actually true. This is a really interesting year to talk about what happens when the landscape tries to wake up in the spring because spring hasn't really sprung yet in Nebraska. It's kind of gone like this. So what happened up here is a lot of the plant material got cut back in the fall, which oftentimes we don't recommend because you're gonna lose the seed heads, you're gonna lose the habitat, some of that beautiful winter interest. In this case, a lot of the landscape got cut back because there is a pretty serious vole population up here. So as your plants are emerging in the spring, it's a really good time to take a look and see what happened under the crown. Are there little tunnels? Are there places where the soil has been mounded up that might be a ground squirrel or a vole? Then you can figure out whether you're going to actually dig the whole plant up, reset it, 
figure out how to get rid of the vole population, and then make sure your plants go into the rest of the season in good condition. This is also the time of year when we talk about cutting back those suffrutescent plants, or the ones that we call subshrubs. They're the ones that have a woody caudex or base. The top is not reliably hardy. It's kind of a small list, but butterfly bush, like these, are a really good example. And in a bad winter, or a winter where we have all those temperature extremes, what you see is you see twiggage like this that is just gonna snap. If you cut it back too early in the spring, we can still get those freezes that will drive the, the, the water down into what remains of the stem and crack it even further. We don't see much life yet, even at the base of these shrubs. So it's the time when you can cut them back, but don't take anything all the way to the ground. If your landscape was mulched, either intentionally or unintentionally with all those matted down leaves, make sure that you start to pull that mulch away from the crowns of the plants because they will be emerging and stretching for the sunlight and you wanna make sure they get enough sun, but keep that mulch handy just in case the temperatures drop again. This is also when you look at plants that really have had the center die out. We see that in Siberian iris, we see it in a lot of the grasses. So you take a peek at that and decide to put that on your list of things to dig and divide and reset and replace. And of course, all good gardeners, as they're looking at their landscape emerging or waking up in the spring, have in mind where can they put all that really cool new plant material that they know is on their list to buy, they just haven't gotten it yet. So believe it or not, spring really will be here soon. And for all of our disciplines, the message is the same. Be patient, observe, get prepared. And then spring shall spring, the flowers will riz or yeah, rise that'll be here. or something. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you get the last picture, which is a six-year-old citrus lime tree uh, covered with all sorts of insect stuff. She's tried neem, she's tried house plant bug spray, soapy water, a systemic. Uh, she wants to use Rose RX or clip the branches that are covered in the, uh, in the insects. Well, the first thing I'm gonna say, I hope she's not eating the limes or using the limes as f for any kind of consumption after she's used a systemic insecticide on this tree. Mm -hmm. um, it's scale insects. Uh, in this case, she's already tried a lot of, of pesticides in this case different things that we normally recommend. If it's not working, you can either trash the whole plant and start over after you've maybe left not one in your house for a few months to make sure nothing's lurking around that might reestablish. Or you can go through the painstaking part of, you can cut off the main parts that are heavily infested to try to knock down the population and then go over it with like a wet towel and kind of lightly scrub those scale insects off to get them off of there. But that's gonna be a little, very labor intensive and it's gonna to matter to you how much that plant is worth in the end, to you personally, right. how much effort you wanna put into it. All right, or go buy another one. That's another option. <laughs> okay, all right. So this is a an elementary school in Blair, Matt. All right. a, a hill, a, a pretty steep hill. Uh, and I think the picture was taken at the sidewalk level, so that yeah. gives you a notion. Um, seeded in February, it was actually graded in December. The turf germinated, it's pretty patchy. They wonder what they should consider doing and do they need to remove that cover that's been holding the hill? Um, odds are you would not need to remove it. It looks like it's a straw mulch, so it doesn't really need to be taken off. Uh, you're probably gonna do more harm with that, pulling some of the seedlings up. but. I wouldn't worry about it too soon or just yet. There's probably gonna be more emerging. Uh, doing a dormant seeding like that, I, I think that's one of the best ways to get a lawn established in the spring. So just be patient with it. Um, odds are it's gonna fill in a little bit more as we get you know, a couple weeks of warm weather. Finally, I think it'll be all right. All right, thank you, Matt. All right, Kyle, uh, this is a, a viewer who's been <clears throat> seeding tomatoes, a couple of early season varieties, sown 25th of February. He's under LED lights, uh, but he's now beginning to see some leaf curl and some wilting in the okay. lower canopy leaves. And then he's seeing what he, he's calling some white things. And I don't think he's talking about the perlite in the, in the potting mix. So wondering, is this something you need a sample on or yeah, can well, you tell? Um, just from looking at the looking at these pictures, the the pots do look 
pretty moist. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to guess that they've just been overwatered and they're a little mm -hmm. bit a little bit too wet, and that's going to be causing the to some of the other stresses that such as the leaf curl and, and whatnot. As for the as for those white little fungal growths that were occurring at the towards the base of the base of the seedling. Probably not anything to worry about. If it were, if you were growing these outside and seeing that, there are a couple of diseases. But I think that uh, he had mentioned that um, this was brand new, brand new potting mix, and everything was fresh this year. So probably nothing to worry about as far as those small, small fungal masses. All right. Thank you so much. All right, Jeff. Last picture question. Uh, this is a Central City picture taken by a Council Bluffs, Iowa viewer. And obviously not taken mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, wondering what this large shrub is, uh, eight, 12 feet high, eight to 10 feet across, likes it, I'm assuming. Right, right. So what do, what do we have So here? that's Rose of Sharon. Uh, so it's one of the hardy hibiscus. Uh, <coughs> sometimes it's be referred to as Althea. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, I think my grandmother had an Althea and that's what we called it then. We didn't call it hibiscus. And they do get quite large. They bloom on new wood. Um, and so it's one of those that, you know, the upside and downside to them is they can be very pretty with a lot of flowers. They can get quite large, which can be an issue. And they're a bit coarse. So that's the other thing. They're, they're, um, their texture can be kind of coarse. So, so I think in a, in a large landscape, um, it, it would work well. But if you have a smaller landscape, it may not fit quite as well. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Well, we have a couple of announcements of fun things in the gardening world, beginning with the UNL Horticulture Club's <laughs> spring sale, Thursday and Friday, the 26th and 27th, East Campus in the teaching greenhouses. So we have a, uh, an email on the screen for more information for that one. And our second one is the annual Douglas Sarpy County's Master Gardener Workshop, Veggies and Herbs Contained, Saturday, April 28th at the Nebraska Extension Office. So uh, fun things in the gardening world. All right, guys, we have time for a handful of questions. Uh, this is a Seward viewer, Wayne, who lives on an acreage, has a huge anthill. The picture was a little blurry, so we couldn't put it in, but a huge anthill taking over the cat mint in a rock bed. So what do we do about huge anthills? With a large anthill like that, uh, you can use some of the baits that Joey put up last week that are labeled for outdoor use. Um, it's likely one of the large uh, formica species that uh, are out there. Um, and they're gonna vary on their type. So you may wanna vary it up. Get some of the sweet baits, get some of the protein baits, get some of the uh, lipid-based baits, and use them all out there in conjunction. See which ones they're going to, and then if you find one that they're going to, remove the others and put the ones out that they're going to. And then those baits, just like Jody explained last week, as they take that bait back into the nest, should kill it from the inside out. Get rid of the queen, stop the colony growing. Unfortunately, there's nothing you can really do to stop it in the future. You might want to maybe, if your cat mint's really thick, it may have been just a good place for them to start and you maybe want to thin that a little bit. I, if it were me, I'd poke them with a stick. Flood them. <laughs> <laughs> That's way more fun. <laughs> poke down in there, let them so, run out. Now children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, Matt, um, let's see, this viewer is wondering, is this the right time for weed and feed on the lawn? And if he spreads a little bit more of the weed and feed on the neighboring property, will that help the weeds from coming back over? Well, if he's allowed to, <laughs> yes, but uh, yeah. uh, weed and feed, it's, it could be time. Uh, with those products, you wanna make sure that you have a wet, uh, wet weeds, I guess. You want to do it when there's a dew on the ground. That way they actually stick to the plant because the, the herbicide gets into the plant by sitting on top of it with that dew. Um, so yes, you could apply weed and feed products now. Um, this next week, I'm sure we're going to see some good, good weather to, to apply those products. All right. Thank you. We have about 30 seconds, Kyle. Okay. A little tiny white fungus about the size of a thumbnail along a dark streak in a native service berry. Bad idea. Bad thing. Uh, it easily could be. Um, I would guess, you know, it could be uh, powdery mildew uh, as far as control. Anything that you can do to increase increase airflow. So do some pruning if if possible. Just try to decrease that leaf uh, that leaf wetness period as much as possible, and that will prevent the fungus from spreading and moving it throughout. 
All right, good answer, and hopefully we don't have to cut down the service berry, in right? Indeed. <laughs> they haven't bloomed yet on campus, but when they do, they are absolutely mm -hmm. fabulous, and one of those native things that Jeff can I eat. I can eat.